Here's our interview with Chad Prather. So um, I'd like to introduce you as the next governor of the state of Texas, <laughs> but I, I hesitate to do that because the last time I did that, it didn't go so well. I, I hosted Caitlyn Jenner's first campaign event at my house, <laughs> and I introduced, wow. her, I introduced her as the next governor of the state of California. <laughs> <laughs> That's like Glenn. You know, Glenn always says he refuses to endorse anybody anymore because he says his endorsement is a kiss of death. So I said, <laughs> okay, well, just keep it to yourself, Glenn. <laughs> right, right. Well, then Larry Elder joined the race. Yeah. And I I, I, I got to admit, I kind of shifted loyalties a bit and, and got involved in his campaign. And there was a glimmer of hope there. There was about 15 minutes, I think, when I really thought he was going to win, which is yeah, me too. silly for me to have thought considering the state that, that we're in. Um, but he was an amazing, he's an amazing candidate and I'm he's sure an amazing you're going to make, you know, Larry's an amazing man. Uh, I appreciate Larry's voice and, and just a tremendous conservative voice. Uh, and I thought I was the same way, especially when a person, you know, a girl in a gorilla mask on a bicycle bounces an egg off your head. I'm thinking you can't pay for that kind of campaign publicity. That's fantastic. So I thought, who knows, maybe that'll push him up over the edge, but it didn't. So to, oh, California's what, crazy, man. What's unbelievable is the, the left is always looking for examples of racism, right? Yeah. And here they finally get one. They get a girl in a gorilla mask throwing an <laughs> egg at a black political candidate. And I don't think it made the news anywhere on no. mainstream media. No, we did. We did a couple of hits. We, we pre-taped a couple of hits talking about that story. And we actually taped two different versions of the lead. And it was me and Andrew Wilkow. And we did a, a if if Larry had won. And well, he almost he didn't make it. You know, we had to film two of those. That's how close it was. I mean, you really didn't know which way that recall was going to go. But gosh, man, you know, Gavin Newsom. And listen, let me, let me just tell you, you know, doing doing live comedy for as long as I have. California has been my most supportive state over the years. Uh, you know, and people, people, you know, coming from Texas, that surprises people. But normally I do 16 very large shows in California every year. Of course, coronavirus shut all that down for two years. Bakersfield to February 2020 was the last time I was out there. And uh, there's good people in California. They're just really getting hosed over by bureaucracy. It's a bad, bad deal, man. Those big cities are... And Sacramento and Gavin Newsom and that administration is terrible for the state. Yeah, the, the the infrastructure that the Democrats have here is extremely strong. So not only is, are, is the state two to one Democrat, but mm -hmm. um, you, you know the the control that they have as far as uh, the the reach of the party, the resources of the party, that's what's really hard to beat. So you know, yeah. Elder ended up losing by over twenty points, which is pretty mm -hmm. discouraging. Yeah. And makes you wonder, you know, I think he was thinking he was going to run again in 2022. Um, you know, Newsom will be up again in November, but I don't know now. He's got to think twice about right. that. You know, that's a lot right. of points to make up. Yeah. And you don't know if you trust the system, right? You know, it's it's like it is so, so swampy and smarmy and. You, you don't know if all your efforts are for naught, no matter what what happens in that yeah. regard. Well, when you know, they talk about a rigged election. What I kind of figured out in work helping with the elder campaign and so on, at least my theory anyway, is that you know, I'm not sure there's out and out fraud in stolen elections, but as far as it being rigged, yes, it is a bit rigged when you mm -hmm. have these mail in votes that are going out. Every single home in California has got a live ballot sitting in it. Some of them have 20 ballots sitting in it that have been mailed to addresses from people that used to live there and so on. So you just have live ballots floating around the state in the tens of millions, literally. Yeah. And then you've got a, a political machine, the Democrat Party, um, able to go knocking door to door in the inner cities and helping people fill them out and, and mail them in and so on. And so if you want to call that rigged, that's what's going on. However, well, you want to I, I agree. It. I agree with you wholeheartedly. It, it's not that it's a rigged deal. I mean, they've tampered with elections for generations. We, they always have. The right and the left have done that. Uh, anybody that denies that's just—it's crazy. And uh, sorry, I might have lost you there for a second. I had a call that came in. Uh, but what I what I do say is that people have uh, built a system that will fail. The, the system for voting—they've built it to fail. Uh, and, and sometimes it fails in a certain favor. And I, and I think that is what we're really up against in a big way. 
uh, and that's what we got to fight against. California being a living example of that reality. Yeah. Yeah. Mail-in voting is here to stay, certainly in California, where it doesn't yep. matter whether you're going to be absent or not. doesn't matter whether you request it. We're sending you a ballot. And that is a yep. live ballot. That's where we are in California right now. I'm not sure. You don't have that in Texas, I don't think, do you? No, uh, it, it, but it's but it's on thin ice. It's on thin ice. People are really people who don't know, you know, the perception is Texas is this real conservative bastion. It's not. It's very purplish. Uh, all six of our major cities are very blue, including Fort Worth, which is where I live, where I'm at right now, has now, as of 2018, gone blue. Um, and so it's a, it's a sad situation. Uh, the rest of Texas, of course, still very conservative. Um, but our, even our politics here in Austin has gotten so big. You know, and that's why I jumped into this thing. Uh, you know, my whole platform is let's get government out of our life. And, and we're really replicating the, the, the federal government, Washington, D.C. model of, of just becoming a blob and everything that we touch, we consume, and it just gets bigger and bigger and ever expansive. And, and Texas is, is just, I was going to say slowly becoming that, but it's very quickly becoming that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I know Abbott, for most people, uh, for most conservatives outside of Texas, is kind of a a, a, a shining beacon of light for us here in California. But you've yeah. made the point, I think, that Abbott has not always held to conservative values. And am I right that no. your biggest complaint about him was that he had a lot of executive orders, uh, um, well, know, executive he, mandates on shutdowns? He did. You know, and if you look at it, you know, I've counted 14 constitutional violations on the part of Abbott in the last 18 months. That's 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 ridiculous. I mean, that, that's like uh, hiring a security team to, to guard your compound. Right. And you say, don't come in my bedroom unless it's life or death. Don't mess with my kids. Don't touch my wife. You know, you break one rule and I hire another security team. Abbott's broken it over and over and over again. But it's a campaign season. Right. So he's going to keep saying the, the things that that Republican voters want to hear. But he's not going to do them. And, and there's a huge antithesis when you compare him and, say, a, a, a Ron DeSantis. Ron does them. You know, Ron says it and does it. Uh, people would be hard pressed to, to look at Texas and say, OK, Greg Abbott's actually doing these things. But I've discovered if you've got enough money, if you have enough money, you can make yourself look like anything. And, you know, Abbott has a lot of money. And so he says, well, we're going to do this on the border. And people say, yeah, see, he's fixing the border. No, he's not. He's not doing anything. He says he's going to, but he doesn't do it because a few few months ago or about a month ago, I, I took seven headlines of what Abbott was going to do on the border and I posted them. The problem was it's 2021 and those were headlines from 2015. They were exact same things that he was saying he was going to do on the southern border. They never got done. and It's not being done now. I mean, just plain and simple fact. And I defy anyone, anyone out there to tell me one thing that he's actually doing that he says he's going to do. So so he has not sent the National Guard to the border? He sent, he sent well, we have a, a few National Guard at the border. You know, out of a resource of 25,000, I mean, there's, there's about 5,000 down there spread out, and he just put another, there's another conglomerate down in Eagle Pass. Uh, Eagle Pass is one place, but where everybody, when they turn on the news and they look, there's, uh, there's uh, the issues going on, like all the Haitians under International Bridge, that's Val Verde County. That's Del Rio, Texas. That's where the real hot spot is. That's that's the problem. And there's no question about it. Even if the National Guard are there, I have witnessed with my own eyes National Guardsmen helping people out of the river and bringing them into the interior of Texas. So it, their presence is one thing. What they're being asked to do and allowed to do as far as um, um, honoring the oath they took to enforce the law is a, is a completely different thing. But the fact of the matter is we've got so many resources, the DPS resources. I mean, they mirror the military in terms of their human and material resources. We're not we're not truly deploying any of that stuff. Uh, and, and so also, uh, the, you know, again, to the National Guard, they got to be allowed to do their job. And they're just not being allowed to do it. Yeah. Well, I guess the question is, what can they do and what should they be doing? I mean, obviously, well, the, it's a federal border that should be patrolled by the feds. Yeah. Border Patrol, et cetera. It's not happening. We see it's not happening. It's intentionally not happening. They're allowing illegals to cross the border, processing them apparently, and then letting them go in the U.S. But what, what yeah. could the Texas National so, Guard so do about it, that? 
it, one of the things that's happening is, and I call it a political, they're protecting a political blame game. So the DPS troopers, in many cases, when, when these illegals come across the border, they come across with a big plastic sack on their back, right? And that's to keep their goods dry and their change of clothes and so on and so forth. They come across, they strip down completely naked right there, uh, you know, in, in the, the basically a parking lot right on the other side of the river. They leave all of their stuff, they change in their clothes, and they don't run off, they just wait. They wait, and the, and the DPS troopers wait there with them. And what they're waiting on is the Border Patrol to come pick them up. Border Patrol acts like an Uber that takes them to a processing center where they get processed in. Uh, they get checked, and then they, in many cases, uh, most cases, actually, they get a court date that says you got to appear again in two years, and then they disappear. Uh, they're not coming back for a court date. So you ask, you know, what can you do? You got to stop that at the border. At the end of the day, we've got to stop asking the federal government's permission for us to do our job as a state. What we're up against is not a refugee or migrant situation. We're up against an invasion. I mean, you're talking millions of people coming across, and they're not just from the southern border. You know, I mentioned Valverde County, which is 120 miles of border with Mexico. They've apprehended over 84 nationalities this year alone. That's 84 nationalities. There's not 84 countries below us and below our southern border. So they're coming from all over, and it ain't France or Finland. They're coming from Yemen and Oman and, uh, you know, the Sudan. They're coming from Iran and Iraq, and they're coming from some, some places that really wish us harm. So, you know, what we've got to do is, you know, in, in a case, you know, the Texas Constitution, Article 4, uh, Section 7, says that if the federal government, is, you know, that the, the the governor, in a case of, uh, of the federal government kind of abandoning you, which is obviously what's happening, the governor of the state becomes the commander in chief. He's got the he's got the right to employ the National Guard, the militias, the state guard, all the resources at his disposal to basically stop them at that border and say, no, you're not coming across. You can't step foot across this. You know, I got a good friend who's running for land commissioner here in the state of Texas. He's got a great idea. Uh, he says, we need to dig the Rio Grande out and make it a, a navigable river for commercial uh, transport. He said, one, it makes it uncrossable. <laughs> and same, we can monitor it as well for uh, with law enforcement as far as federal trade so or international trade. So there's a ton of things that we could be doing out there, not the least of which is we control 23 bridges that come across. Uh, we can stop commercial trade with Mexico so that they feel the financial heat the economic heat and put a stop to it themselves. Um, you know, we control our roads, we control our highways, we can enforce that, but most of our agents are being kept, you know, well inland and they're not right there on the border. So, you know, it, and then take in the fact that we've got to disincentivize the reason so many are trying to come across the border. Uh, you know, we've get, we're giving them health care, we're giving them welfare, we're giving them, you know, we're feeding them, we're giving them education. Uh, the, the numbers and the statistics are just insane and we're sitting back and allowing it to happen at the, at the cost of not only taxpayer dollars, but in some cases, taxpayer lives. Yeah, I think it's pretty obvious what's going on when, when they come across. They have children here and those children become citizens. Yep. And 18 years later, they're voting citizens. And in California, uh, due to the influx, we're at almost 40 percent, right? About 40 percent Hispanic in, in the state. They're voting 70 percent Democrat. And I think that the Democrats see this. And that's why they want that. That's why they're letting them in because they, they see do. them all as votes. Is, is there any other explanation for it? I, I can't think of any. I, and, it, and it's been a long, and it's been a long time plan. So I, I, I referred to my friend Weston Martinez that's running for land commissioner in Texas. I saw him the other night. He's got a handful of IDs from uh, Chile, and these are pictures of Haitians. These these are not Chileans. These are Haitians. Uh, and they've been in Chile since uh, 10 years, since the earthquake in Haiti. They've been there that long, and they're dropping those IDs on the, other, on the Mexico side of the river. They're dropping those IDs. They're coming across. They're trying to claim asylum uh, as, as, as Haitian refugees, and, uh, and we're bringing them in. And they're just disappearing into the interior of the country. You know, when they said that there were 13,000 that vanished out of the International Bridge a couple of weeks ago, the number was really more like about 23,000. They talk about a, a group coming between anywhere. The estimates are between 35 and 50,000. It's really more like about 85,000 that are on their way. So these caravans are just getting bigger and bigger. Uh, they have no concept of legal migration into the country. Uh, and so they're coming and, and their intention is, uh, you know, a free, open welcome. Now, those in South Texas are seeing a different story, and they're starting to act against that. So down in the Rio Grande Valley, for instance, McAllen, 
they just uh, had a historic election at this last cycle where they elected uh, Mayor Villalobos, who was a Republican. Uh, that's the first time they've ever had a conservative Republican voted mayor in McAllen. And they're starting to see in the Rio Grande Valley more and more support. Uh, I, there was a huge percentage of them that voted for Donald Trump in the 2020 election. So they're seeing they're seeing how these Democrat policies have abandoned them uh, to suffer a fate that, that they have no control over with this migration issue. Uh, and so more and more of them are starting to push back politically. But we've got to stand behind them and kind of hold their arms up and, and help them legally as well to make sure that they're, they're no, no longer encroached. You know, uh, and what I say is, you know, kind of a five step thing is detect, deter, detain, deport and defend. And, and none of those are politically correct in the grand scheme of things. But we've got to create not only what I say, a, a physical wall and barrier on the border, but we need a human wall, a law enforcement wall that says, no, you're not coming across. Mm -hmm. So talking about the campaign, um, you talked about Texas is not as conservative as people think it is. Whoever the Republican nominee is, whether it be Abbott or or hopefully you, uh, what what's the race looking like for next November? Is a Republican a, a shoe in to win the governorship in Texas or not necessarily? Is, is you know, I, if, let's let's say what we assume to know right now, and that would be a Robert Francis O'Rourke on the Democrat ticket. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I'd be, if I was a betting man, I'd say he's going to be their Democrat uh, uh, candidate. And the reason being, if you go back to 2018, when he was on the ticket against uh, Senator Ted Cruz, it's a very slight margin that he lost by. But he didn't lose the ballot. He won on the down ballot. There were a lot of seats that were flipped in the House and the Senate, as well as city council seats and various other uh, uh, offices that were flipped, all because Beto O'Rourke was on the ballot. He is a fundraising machine. The money comes in from California, Hollywood, the elites all over, the multinational corporations, Silicon Valley. Of course, they're going to spend tens of millions of dollars to try to get Beto O'Rourke uh, on that ballot and ultimately elected. And so it's a formidable force when you consider how much money is there. So you take, uh, and, and not, not Texas money either. So on the flip side, you got Greg Abbott. Greg Abbott is also a cash cow. He, he claims to have about $60 million in a campaign war chest. Uh, it's amazing to me, by the way, that people will spend 80 or $90 million to get elected to an office that's only going to pay you $153,000 a year. So that ought to tell you the, the power of the position of the governor of Texas. So a shoe in no, I, I wish that we could say that, but by and large, more and more, we're getting very purple. As I said, I was doing a report uh, recently with a newspaper out of Brenham, Texas, and she said, if you make it to Austin, you think you can handle it since Austin's not like the rest of Texas. I said, well, it's funny you say that because uh, the fact that you don't, that the capital of Texas isn't like the rest of Texas is very telling. Uh, you know, that's something that's got to be flipped over. It's, it's got to be changed because... I believe that Texas is the last true bastion of freedom that has the economy, the size, the leverage, the people, the resolve, the, the legacy, the history, all these values that have the ability to put Washington, D.C. back on the right track. Now, they don't want to be put back on that track. So there's a very big target on the back of Texas. They want to see Texas flip. They want to see Texas become another California. Uh, they want it to become an Illinois, a New York, or an Oregon, or Washington State. Well, and, and illegal immigration can can provide a huge tool for that. Because, it will do you know, that. We used to have a, a long run of Republican governors here in California, right. and and the only explanation for for the switch is is the illegal immigration. And you're right there at the border, so yeah, it's happening in Texas. And you're right, we we need examples of the other way to do it. You know, when if it gets to the point where California is the only way to do it, I mean, California's got the highest unemployment rate in the country the most affluent state, fifth largest economy in the world. And yet we've got the highest unemployment mm -hmm. in, in the country. How do you explain that? Yeah. <laughs> it's by how it's being run. So we need to have examples of other states to point to like Texas and Florida. So if that goes away, God help us. Yeah. And look how close Florida was to having an Andrew Gillum as their governor. Uh, you know, Ron DeSantis didn't win by a huge margin. And we know from the things that came out about Gillum shortly thereafter, it would not have been a good uh, leadership choice there. So a lot of times people right now, they're pointing to Florida as, as this big example. But, you know, Florida's in the doldrums as well of being very, very divided. Ron DeSantis, fortunately, is a man of action and understands with his delegated authority comes uh, a responsibility to not be a politician, but to be a patriot. And that's exactly what he's doing, standing up for the 
folks who had elected him to represent them. You know, in the state of Texas, and you notice D.C. sort of has a target on our backs, both Texas and Florida, but specifically Texas, because, you know, New Mexico, Arizona and California, they have a southern border. But if you turn on the news, the focus is on South Texas. They really want Texas to fall. They want Texas to become weak and, and, uh, and just drive it into the ground. You know, I, I talk about how, you know, I think that this is a controlled crash of America because the globalists really are kind of driving us into the ground. We're seeing a, a crash of the economy. The inflation's out of control. We see our supply chain, what's happening. And they do this stuff unapologetically. It's like they don't want to nosedive the, the plane. They want to leave just enough value to hand it over to who, who knows, maybe the U.N. to run this whole thing. But, you know, I go back to Barack Obama, who said he wanted a fundamental change of America. And then the other day, Jen Psaki, who mentioned Joe Biden and his fundamental change to the American economy. I think we've had enough fundamental changes at this point. I think it's time we go back. We want to fundamentally change. Let's fundamentally change back to our roots and the basis of our Constitution and build from there. Yeah. Well, you have my vote for governor, Chad. Um, let, let, let's hit, hit the book. Let's promote the book real quick before sure. we run out of time. Am I crazy? An unapologetic patriot takes on the insanity of today's woke world. And uh, what kind of struck me just kind of reading the description was that apparently you've got a lot of uh, advice or ideas for uh, marriages and parenthood. I have a three month old, <laughs> my first child, by the way. So what do you got to tell me? What do I need to know yeah. about raising this child in today's well, I, I'll climate? tell you, you know, and the, and the whole thing is this, you know, I wrote this book from a humorous perspective. I call it my common sense guide to the end of the world. And in the woke mob, the woke culture is attacking everything from politics to culture to parenting and marriages and, and, and everything that we've ever had as a traditional value. And what I keep telling people, and I've raised five kids and, and they're all doing very well and, and they're great kids, huge sense of identity. And I, I always say, make sure that we give our kids a sense of identity because the schools aren't going to do it. Woke culture's not going to do it. That's why we have people who can't figure out their pronouns and their genders and all these various other identifiers that are out there. And if we teach them who they are and we send them out into the world with a sense not only of identity and destiny so that they can leave a legacy, uh, you know, I think that we can turn this, this ship around. And so I try to take a humorous look at, at these things. Like I've got a chapter in there called, Yes, I Beat My Kids. And uh, I've had the woke mob come after me for just that title. The whole book or whole chapter, rather, is about when they were growing up, we play chess. I wouldn't let them win. If we played checkers, I didn't let them win. They had to beat me. And so, yeah, I, you know, I painted the walls with the blood of their knights and their pawns. And they learned from that, you know, because I don't believe in participation trophies and, and just letting you win. I wanted you to earn it. And so, you know, I, I see that now. Uh, replicated over and over again in, in the accomplishments that my kids are, are, are doing out there in the world today. And so, yeah, best of luck, best wishes and God's <laughs> grace. But yeah, man, teach them who they are and, and turn them loose. Yeah, no, I, I do think the breakdown of the American family generally is really one of America's biggest problems and the, the art of parenting and, and, and how important parenting is and having two loving parents at home. What I always like to say is, is when you talk about privilege, the, the, the only privilege that's out there is the privilege of being raised by two loving parents. That's a privilege. Children who've had that are privileged. I'm privileged for that reason. And, um, you know, we need more privileged children. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and we do. And I unapologetically say we need men to be men, women to be women. Uh, and, and we need to be unapologetic about that. There are certain things that men and women bring to the table that the other don't bring, uh, you know, respectively. And we've got to stop apologizing. And right now, those those are the things that are under attack. We see that firsthand, and we've got to fight back for it. Yeah. La last thing, since you're a comedian, I'm just curious your thoughts about this whole Dave Chappelle situation and, you know, com allowing comedians to be comedians. I remember last time I went to the comedy store here in L.A., it was a couple of years ago, and I was actually kind of shocked at what the comedians were saying. It's like, oh, my gosh, nobody says this kind of stuff anywhere in this woke culture but comedians are still saying it they're making fun of woke culture yeah. you know and bill maher is out there saying that hey you know we got to let comedians be comedians here and now Chappelle's under attack so what do you say on behalf of a of the the, the comedy world you know I, I i always tell people and remind them the two places that should be the most offensive if you will uh and cause some introspection and and, uh, you know, you to kind of look at yourself in a different way. One is the church pulpit and another is the comedy stage. Uh, they should be offensive. Uh, they should tell the truth. And they, they should be, you know, when it comes to comedy, mocking and ridicule is in the job description. 
Uh, and we should be able to go in there and be made to feel uncomfortable. That's why I always say, you know, I make fun of myself, uh, but I don't care if you're gay, straight, black, white, fat, skinny, trans. I don't care what you are. I'm going to make fun of you because that's what we get to do, right? We, we get to tell jokes and somebody has to be the punchline. But uh, I love that, that Dave is at least coming back and saying, I'm not apologizing. And if this is cancel culture, give me more of it. Uh, and, and Bill Maher, who, who these days makes a way more sense than I want to give him credit for, but he does. And they, they come out and say, look, man, if, you, if it's something that you're going to get offended by, well, then in the world of comedy, like that's what you should be making fun of. You know, I, I remember Steve Harvey saying, you know, it's hard to be a comedian because when a tragedy happens, like we have the jokes written that day. And, and so like it's, there's like never a time limit. You know, we talk about, oh, is it too soon? No, is it like in the world of comedy, it's not. You know, let's go get them. Uh, but people can't compartmentalize that. And let me go back. You know, that's where that identity thing comes in. If you know who you are, you're not so easily offended. Right. And you're not so quick to be victimized or to at least feel like you are. Right. So we got to quit all this nonsense. And uh, and so it's crazy what's happening. You know, I think Dave's going to experience more and more success uh, financially. And in terms of getting a whole garnering a whole new audience, what he does with it from here on out is up to him in that regard. But yeah, free speech has a place. There's a lot of comedians out there that, that are my friends that I don't agree with. Uh, I don't even agree with their, their politi politics or, or their viewpoints. But damn, they make me laugh. And, and that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Check out his interview if you haven't seen it with David Letterman. The Letterman interviews he does on Netflix. Yeah. Chappelle, uh, Letterman interviews Chappelle and he explains why he left the Chappelle show, which was really interesting, kind of plays into all this. Anyway, all right, my friend. Well, I think we got the book covered. We're going to push the book, and we're going to push our Texas listeners to uh, to vote for you. Thank you, man. Yeah, tell people to go to prather2022.com. And uh, for the book and the show and all the other crazy stuff I've got going on, watch chad.com. Thank you again to our guest, Chad Prather. Support his campaign. Go online and find his campaign website, Support Prather for Governor of Texas. Also, Go online and find his new book, Am I Crazy? An Unapologetic Patriot Takes on the Insanity of Today's Woke World. Thank you to Chad. Thank you to our producer, Michael Parker. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back soon with another episode of The Hidden Truth Show. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Truth Show with Jim Breslow. You can find us at hiddentruthshow.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Truth Show. Join us again next week for another episode of Hidden Truth Show with Jim Breslow.